China's National People's Congress recently adopted an interpretation of Article 104 of the Basic Law of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. It clarifies the legal requirements of those running for election and taking public office in Hong Kong. It also clarifies legal consequences should civil servants violate or disagree with the swearing-in oath. The interpretation came, China asserts, after some lawmakers elect in Hong Kong violated the basic law during an oath-taking ceremony. But why in response was the interpretation needed? What's the legal status of the basic law? How to understand one country, two systems? Finally, to what extent does Hong Kong maintain its judiciary independence and has it now been damaged? Answering these questions gets us closer to China. China's National People's Congress Standing Committee unanimously passed its interpretation of Article 104 of the Hong Kong Basic Law. The interpretation states that Article 104 is mostly about political loyalty. These Hong Kong independence figures are splitting and going against the country. How can they uphold the Hong Kong Basic Law and be loyal to the region? This recent interpretation prevents two lawmakers elect from taking their seats in Hong Kong's Legislative Council. Earlier in October, as they took their oaths, both of them displayed pro-independence okay, banners and used derogatory language, widely interpreted as insulting the Chinese mainland. Their swearing-in was declared invalid. The interpretation makes it clear that any oaths taken in a manner that is not sincere or solemn will be taken as invalid. The officer or legislator will not be allowed to take office. I and the SCR government support the interpretation passed by the NPCSE today. As the chief executive of the SAR, I have the duty to implement the basic law in accordance with Article 48 of the basic law. I and the SAR government will implement the interpretation fully. Article 158 gives the National People's Congress Standing Committee the power to interpret the basic law. Since Hong Kong's return to China in 1997, the NPC Standing Committee has interpreted the basic law five times. To understand the recent interpretation by the NPC of Hong Kong's basic law and its relationship between Hong Kong's judicial system, I speak with two thought leaders. Ms. Elsie Leung was first secretary for justice of Hong Kong's special autonomous region from 1997 to 2005. In 2006, she was appointed deputy director of the Hong Kong Basic Law Committee under the National People's Congress Committee. And law professor Rao Ge Ping, head of the Center for Hong Kong and Macau Studies at Peking University. He also serves on the Hong Kong Basic Law Committee under the National People's Congress Standing Committee. Welcome. Ms. Leung, I'd like to start with you. What happened in Hong Kong to create what's been called a constitutional crisis such that the National People's Congress had to intervene. Two of the um, legislative councillors did not take off in accordance with the, um, uh, the statutory form. First of all, they used exceptional attire. That is, one of them put on a banner on which is inscribed, Hong Kong is not China. And the other one displayed the banner in front of her. Um, they also used language which was obscene and insulting, uh, using the word Shina. Yeah. What, what was the significance but, uh, of that Shina mispronunciation? Shina is more than just some mis um, the, the pronunciation. Um, uh, China, the, the word Shina, everybody knows, is an insulting term for Chinese people. And um, it is banned even in Japan. So the um, central people's government has the responsibility mm to do something about it by clarifying Article 104 of the Basic Law, uh, which uh, required um, the officials named in this article, that is the Chief Executive, members of Executive Council, members of Legislative Council, principal officials, um, and uh, judis uh, judges at all levels of the court and ju other judicial uh, officials um, to uphold the Basic Law and to swear allegiance 
to the Hong Kong F, uh, SAR of the People's Republic of China. Order! Order! In the UK, members of both houses of parliament on taking their seats are required by law to take an oath of allegiance to the crown. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Until the oath or affirmation is taken, an MP may not receive a salary, take his seat, speak in debates, or vote. They can also be fined 500 pounds, and more importantly, if they attempt to take their seat, have their seat declared vacant as if they were dead. Professor Rao, could you uh, give us an understanding of Article 104 of the Basic Law of the Hong Kong? The content of the oath is stipulated. The content of the oath is prescribed as legal content according to the NPC's legal interpretation. This has already been affirmed and no changes are allowed. There are two things. First, the oath taker must uphold the basic law of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China. Second, the oath taker must swear allegiance to the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China. The two words uphold and allegiance reflect the principle of political allegiance of those who seek important public office should have towards the target they serve. Here, the target refers to the People's Republic of China and Hong Kong society. To be more specific, the member of the Legislative Council must swear allegiance to the Hong Kong Basic Law and Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, which is a necessary condition of their assuming office. Also, we need to clarify that the principle of political allegiance is being patriotic towards the PRC and Hong Kong SAR. Hong Kong, ruled by Hong Kong people, is based on the fact that they are patriotic towards Hong Kong. The entry is not only Article 104, there's also another law in Hong Kong which the Legislative Council must abide by, is the Oaths and Declarations Ordinance. Article 21 um, of the uh, ordinance particularly said that if someone is invited to take the oath and uh, refuse or neglect to do so, then if he has entered office, he must vacate the office. And if he has not entered the office, he's disqualified from um, entering the office. So um, that's quite clear. But why is it necessary to have an interpretation by the Standing Committee of the NPC? Um, that is because in a previous case in 2002, the court held that um, what the basic law has not prohibited, then the domestic legislation cannot um, uh, uh, put additional requirement. Um, it is not impossible for the court to hold that because um, Article 104 does not spell out the consequence of the non-compliance and therefore the domestic law which is the oaths and declarations ordinance cannot over they cannot put in this additional requirement that the legislative councillor would be disqualified now in order to put the matter beyond doubt it is necessary for the standing committee to make the interpretation to spell out the consequence of non-compliance, what exactly is to take an oath in accordance 104, and who has the power to uh, decide whether or not the oath taken is uh, valid. I think there are two issues here that people are focusing. W one is freedom of speech uh, in Hong Kong, and the other is the independence of the Hong Kong judiciary. So let's start with the second. If there is a violation of any kind in Hong Kong, uh, should it not be the Hong Kong courts, the judicial system in Hong Kong, under the one country, two systems uh, a banner, that uh, adjudicates all such questions such uh, that come up in Hong Kong? Judicial independence and the power of legal interpretation are both stipulated in the basic law and should not conflict with one another. The judicial independence of the Hong Kong SAR is not something hanging in the air. Rather, they are based on a certain time frame and circumstances. In other words, under the political environment of one country, two systems, and the framework of the basic law in Hong Kong. Judicial independence should not go beyond the basic law or even go against it. 
The interpretation power is vested in the NPC by the constitution of the PRC and basic law. It is stipulated in Article 67.4 of the constitution of the PRC that the Standing Committee of the NPC has the power to interpret national law, including the basic law. This is also stated clearly in its Article 158. There are no constraints on the timing and content of the interpretational power. The interpretation clarifies where it is unclear and vague and serves to help understand and implement the basic law, contributing to the rule of law and judicial independence in Hong Kong. So it's far-fetched to say the two are conflicting with one another, let alone that the NPC's interpretation is intervening in Hong Kong's judicial independence. The Standing Committee of the NPC only interpret the law. It does not adjudicate on individual cases. The Hong Kong courts is to administer justice by interpreting the law, including um, uh, and uh, it, it, when it interprets the law, it has is abide, it must abide by the basic law and the interpretation of the basic law. Now, whether the um, interpretation applied to any particular case, and um, what is the meaning of the interpretation, whether there has been any act of refusal or neglect on the part of the official to take the oath um, properly, um, is a matter to be adjudicated by the court. So um, the uh, interpretation does not infringe on judicial independence, does not infringe on the court's freedom to uh, administer justice or adjudicate on cases. So um, there's no um, infringement on the um, judicial independence. This are always sensitive and subject uh, to uh, a different, uh, different approaches, and uh, one can always use hindsight. But uh, some have told me that uh, uh, if the NPC had not intervened, had not uh, issued its interpretation, that the vast majority of the Hong Kong people, even the legal community, would have condemned these legislators, uh, these legislators elect, because their behavior was so obscene and so outrageous. But the fact that the NPC did intervene has actually made something of a martyr of these individuals and has uh, um, actually forced some legal authorities, some people who would have been condemning them now to defend them. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a question of, of dealing subtly and in a sophisticated manner with issues like this in order to properly uh, 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 deal with uh, these kinds of social issues. Uh, sometimes you have the, the effect of exacerbating and making more important uh, 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 people who, uh, w without the intervention, would have just been condemned and, and would disappear. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Gong, I cannot agree with that. Um, the Standing Committee only interpret the law and leave it to the Hong Kong court um, to adjudicate on cases. So um, uh, it resolved something good, uh, itself um, could not have done, uh, that is uh, to deal with the matter speedily. Had the matter gone through the judicial pr process in Hong Kong, it would take a long time. Um, maybe um, uh, one, and, uh, one to two years, or maybe shorter, but still in the meantime, um, that state council is thrown into disarray. Interpretation has um, uh, the effect of the putting an end to this dispute. And with the NPC uh, m doing its interpretation uh, so rapidly, literally in a matter of days, there's a radical difference. But does that not send a message that the central government uh, in Beijing uh, doesn't trust the court system? First of all, the interpretation is not um, distrust of the legal system or the judicial system. It is just to um, the prevent um, any um, decision which would um, have um, uh, been, uh, um, which would, uh, uh, which does not reflect the true meaning of uh, Article and Four, um, and that happened before. So the, um, the power of interpretation, on the one hand, would ensure the basic law is um, properly um, implemented. Uh, secondly, regarding judicial independence, is protected by the basic law. Article 85 of the basic law say that that in, in adjudicate um, the uh, 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 in adjudicating cases there should be no interference on the judiciary and judges would not be responsible uh, for 
for the for the judgment was they delivered. Now um, and also that um, uh, the, the system of appointment of judges, uh, which is very independent, has to be recommended by seven of the nine members of the Judicial um, Officers Recommendations Committee. Um, and the ones appointed uh, and after serving the probative pub period, uh, the judge would serve for life, which means until retirement, and cannot be removed unless um, um, uh, he has misbehavior or unless he's in, uh, in unable to perform his duties. So the, um, the judicial uh, independence is well protected. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the um, standing committee has to lawful power of interpretation of the basic law, and uh, its interpretation would ensure the um, correct um, implementation of the basic law. As of November 7, 2016, the National People's Congress Standing Committee has interpreted the basic law of Hong Kong on five occasions. The government of Hong Kong sought two interpretations of the basic law, the right of abode in 1999 and the term of office of the chief executive in 2005. The Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal requested one interpretation. In 2011, jurisdiction of Hong Kong courts over acts of state. The National People's Congress Standing Committee has also interpreted the basic law on its own initiative twice. The first time was in 2004 on the amendment of the election method for the chief executive and the legislative council. The second time, in the fifth overall interpretation, was delivered recently on November 7th, and it was on the substantial requirements of a lawful oath as contained in Article 104 of the Basic Law. I think this is the first time in the world. 每次司法都针对不同的情况和不同的条款。There are already five interpretations serving various needs and purposes. There are two things about this interpretation. First, it was an active action taken by the NPC Standing Committee to interpret the law. Second, there were also political connotations aside from the legal importance. The society in Hong Kong has a misunderstanding that the NPC can only interpret the law following a request from the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong. This is not accurate. The NPC confers on Hong Kong courts the power to interpret the basic law. When adjudicating final appeals, the Court of Final Appeal can apply for the NPC's legal interpretation. It's an obligation or power. But it doesn't mean that the NPC can't take the initiative to interpret the law in its own right. Does the entire legal community in Hong Kong agree with your analysis? This is not about personal understanding of the law. In fact, it's about the fact that the law must be followed. Hong Kong is a region where common law applies, so the interpretation of the law is through judicial interpretation by judges. This is respected in the basic law. Article 158 also confers on the Hong Kong court the power to interpret provisions of the basic law when adjudicating cases. However, the basic law is a national law in the PRC. The entire Chinese mainland applies the continental law system, which means the legislators are the party to interpret the law. Those who make the law should interpret them as well. This is on clear legal ground. It is not accurate to say that the NPC's power of interpretation has sabotaged Hong Kong's judicial independence. We cannot rule out the possibility that there are people who take advantage of the difference between the two legal systems to picture the interpretation by the NPC as an erosion of Hong Kong's judicial independence. What is the opinion of the Hong Kong legal community? Is it divided on this topic? Basically, the majority of the public supports the interpretation of the law. When you say majority, is that 55 percent or is it 85 percent? Yeah, let's put it this way. The uh, legal community, which means the, those practicing law or having qualification to practice law, is over 10,000. Yes. In addition to that, you still have a few hundred um, uh, law students and so on. Mm. Uh, they had a demonstration which was drawn by, according to the, the organizer, 3,000 um, uh, uh, people. And um, in the, um, the according to the uh, police estimate, it was 1,700. 
so um, uh, maybe you can take that as an estimate well, of, I, I, of the, um, I, the, those opposing it. I, I would say that if that number, whichever, the higher or the lower number, are actually out demonstrating, that would mean that a much larger number support it, because not everybody who would support it would be out demonstrating. I have no other figure to go by. So th this is only the um, figures which I can provide you. Um, I, 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 I understand that uh, some of the legal community does not accept interpretation at all despite the fact that um, the court had time and again uh, uphold the, um, up, uh, the, um, uh, the standing committee's power of interpretation. Now, um, in 2000, in 1999, the court, uh, the court of final appeal clearly say that um, the, the power is derived from the basic law and um, the, uh, uh, whatever the, the National People's Congress or its standing committee um, the, the, the do in accordance with the basic law, um, they have no power to query. And if the standing committee make an interpretation, they must administer justice in accordance with the interpretation. Professor Rao, does it upset you or disturb you that such a large percentage of the Hong Kong legal community is opposed in principle to the uh, intervention and the interpretation of the National People's Congress in this case? No, it's only a fraction of the legal community who has taken to the street. I have seen many friends from the legal community in Hong Kong airing their support for the interpretation publicly and objecting to the two elected members' violation of the law. It is not right for us to translate the demonstrations by some into something supported by the entire community. It doesn't hold water. Both of you are experts. Ms. Leung, you were involved in the process. Uh, could you just give me a, a, a brief uh, uh, synopsis of the history of the basic law, what its fundamental aspect is, very briefly? Basic Law Drafting Committee comprised of uh, 59 members, um, uh, 23 of them from Hong Kong, uh, the rest of them from mainland China. So Hong Kong people participated in the promulgation, in the drafting of the basic law. It was passed on the 4th of the April 1990 and became the operative from the 1st of July 1997. It's the constituent instrument which, um, and, and which um, uh, described the one country, two system. It uh, maintained the previous system and change. By that, I have to explain that by maintaining the system and change, it still means that whatever contained in the base law is part of our legal system. Uh, therefore, apart from the common law, equity, um, the um, legislature, uh, law passed by legislature, and the customary law, the basic law uh, is the basis of our legal system. So um, whatever the, um, uh, um, was not in our previous system, for example, uh, the relationship between central people's government and um, uh, Hong Kong and the power of interpretation, central people's government's role in the development in our uh, de uh, political development and so on are all contained in the basic law. Uh, the basic law is a very special law under China's constitutional system. It's a creation and it's an exception. It's an exception allowed by the Constitution of China, allowing one system to be applied on the Chinese mainland and another in special regions. So the basic law offers a legal and institutional framework to the political principle on sovereignty and historically leftover issues. In addition, the basic law is an authorization law that applies to the special administrative region. The Constitution and the basic law confer the Hong Kong SAR with a higher degree of autonomy than other municipal Municipalities, provinces, and autonomous regions on the Chinese mainland. It's also higher than that of many countries with a singular legal system and that of states in a federal system. Ms. Leung, recognizing that a large minority of the Hong Kong uh, population are concerned about the latest intervention, what can the central government do, and even the Hong Kong authorities do, to show the Hong Kong people and the legal community that they will continue to have the kind of autonomy and judicial independence that you've spoken about and Professor 
Rao has spoken about, what kind of actions or, or uh, statements can be made to encourage your compatriots in Hong Kong that the future is very bright? I think the Central People's Government and the Hong Kong Government, as well as um, the, the public, um, should um, under, uh, should um, explain to the people um, the the the, um, uh, the power of interpretation by the Standing Committee, how it does not infringe on judicial independence, how is judicial independence protected, and um, also what exactly the. the some issues of this bill, for example, uh, the division of the, the three branches of the um, government and so on, uh, uh, all these have all uh, have been uh, quite controversial. Um, there's different understanding of these terms um, in Hong Kong, and all we can do is to continue to educate the people on the exact meaning of this and what is the implication in Hong Kong. I hope Hong Kong colleagues to I also hope colleagues in Hong Kong can study the basic law and the NPC's interpretations better. As I know, lawyers in Hong Kong are too busy to delve deeply into the articles of the basic law, but they would have less confusion if the time was spent. People from the legal community are misleading the public with inaccurate personal understandings. For example, to limit the central government's power to foreign affairs and defence is a wrong idea to regard the interpretations as intervening in Hong Kong's political system, to wrong the universal suffrage in Hong Kong as a fake gesture. All these are distortions of the basic law. So I hope we all can learn more about the basic law and see it as a legal guarantee of Hong Kong. In this way, we can achieve our mutual goal. It's been a great pleasure. I appreciate your sophistication, your elegance, and your uh, open communication. Thank you again. To China, sovereignty and territorial integrity are core interests, blazingly bright red lines that cannot be violated. That's why China's National People's Congress, the body authorized to interpret Hong Kong's basic law, reacted so swiftly and so decisively think was a minor disturbance by lawmakers elect. China argues that, one, the NPC interpretation is about the basic law and its implementation. Two, the basic law provides principles on which Hong Kong's judiciary system operates. And therefore, three, the interpretation does not violate Hong Kong's judiciary independence. Moreover, the judiciary is an important component of sovereignty, and in any contest between competing goods, sovereignty will always prevail. How to handle such events wisely, not overreacting and exacerbating conflict, can be a challenge. Keeping closer to China.